Hello, I'm Gideon Burton. Today I'd like to talk with you about a research and production algorithm for the digital age. How do you produce content, whether it's a research paper or some project, using today's tools? First of all, I want to mention the traditional method and contrast it with the updated methods we might use for today. In a traditional approach, and this is using the model of creating, say, a research paper, you read books and articles, you take notes, think about it, then you go into your drafting phase, and finally you produce finished content. And this goes through the basic processes of brainstorming, then exploring, developing, and finally producing. That's all well and good. But some of the problem with this method is that it is topic-based, which is not wrong, it just may not be best. It's text and print-based, again, not necessarily wrong, but maybe just limited. This is also a fairly isolated production model where you keep what you're doing private until you have completed it. And then mostly this is largely based on exterior motivation. So in contrast to the uh, principles that will inform this different method include it's going to be more outcomes based it will be iterative, which I'll explain, multimodal, using different kinds of media. It will be much more social and much more publicly oriented, both in the process and in the product. And hopefully, it is something that also derives its energy from personal motivation and not just extrinsic uh, motivation. Okay, so let's start by saying, uh, as you're beginning a project, start with the end in mind. And, and be conscious about your process think about it as a process and recognize that you have choices in how you go about doing this and you don't just have to do what you did at a prior time in school or do what your peers do uh, but you can become better at this that's an important attitude to have especially as the tools we have today continue to evolve and develop and processes as well and so it's important to think of our overall goals so we don't get bogged down either with old processes or learning new processes. So it's important to be a conscious learner. Ask yourself, why am I doing this? Uh, it might be that there's a short-term event you're preparing for or some project you're trying to complete or some immediate need that needs to be satisfied. But hopefully you can think of a larger goal as well. Maybe this is building a, a, a talent or an ability in me or a knowledge base. Maybe I'm developing a habit here or simply a perspective. And this is going more towards thinking about what you're doing in terms of lifelong learning and using the present project to build something more important for the future. Now it could be that you are simply doing something because it is a requirement. Maybe you have a, a superior, whether it's a teacher or a boss, that wants you to, to get something done, a, a, a white paper or a research paper or some kind of project. And that's fine. We have, have demands on us all the time and that's an adequate motive. Uh, but that can be um, improved upon if we can add to that uh, a, a broader and maybe more personal motive. If, if you realize what you're doing could be adding to your repertoire or, or helping you with your general education or maybe helping you to practice a very specific kind of skill that you recognize as being valuable on a general level. This is important to get your motives right so that you can um, stick with things when the going gets rough in the process. All right, so I suggest that you ask yourself what difference could doing this make for me and for other people? And I think this helps you to focus both on a personal motives and on audiences and stakeholders and those who might motivate you to get this done. And also you need to ask yourself, how will I know when I've succeeded? Now I'm saying this because uh, very often I'm dealing with students and they're within the framework of, of school and they know when things are done, when an assignment is due, or when a semester has concluded. But I'm trying to prepare my students for lifelong learning and uh, for also the workplace where there's not always firm deadlines given, but there is a work expectation. So it's often up to us to decide, well, how do I know when I've succeeded? So I have some ideas for that. We need to think about both our, our motives and, and how we measure what we are doing. It's okay to satisfy superiors or to our peers in, in having some kind of extrinsic motive. But a term that I've been learning from people in pedagogy recently is something called 
learning subjectives. Most of us have heard about learning objectives, those learning outcomes, goals for a, a syllabus or curriculum of some kind. And those are established by some authority outside of yourself. And a learning subjective is this concept that you know, the subject, the I, the interior, the me, um, I can choose my own uh, goals, my own things I'd like to learn, and um, recognize and appreciate that having those personal goals and interests are going to be very important for you to be a good learner, whether it's in the short term or for the long term. I personally am trying to help my students to see these, some of these as being larger motives and, and measurements. Uh, lifelong learning, digital literacy, uh, helping to build one's personal brand or online identity, uh, learning peer-based production and collaboration, and developing a personal learning network or a professional learning network. I see all of these as being essential capacities or, or activities in uh, the 21st century. And so I, I offer them and hope that they will personalize them and, and see these as being worthwhile things to do as they're working on uh, projects or papers that have been assigned them to do. Okay. Um, oh, I, yeah, I've, I definitely want to emphasize this. When you have a, a, a structure like school with an, an assignment and a professor and, and so on, uh, you have built in feedback mechanisms and formalization because you have a, you know, a grade at least that you get and maybe some written feedback. And uh, the formalization happens in terms of, of there being a, a uh, required assignment or project and there are you know, various parameters you have to meet. But, but if you don't have that structure, that scaffolding, you need to remember that you're not going to learn well or accomplish that uh, creation of a product or content or finish a project well unless you build into what you're doing methods for getting feedback and also for formalizing what you're doing. Now, a lot of times in life we're informally learning all the time and not all that we do needs to go through this, this um, very conscious process that I'm trying to teach today. But sometimes it should go through that sort of conscious process if, if you want to get something out of it. So as you're structuring your lifelong learning, I hope that you'll think about, okay, I need to do something that along the way I'm getting regular feedback on. And I'm also, I also need to do something that gets formalized at a given point. I'll talk about that later in the lecture, what that actually means. But essentially, it's, it's producing something that's uh, visible or tangible, something you can point to later and uh, you put on your resume or something like that. Okay, uh, so the principle behind this is that you need encouragement along the way, uh, and some of that is, is just motivational, and some of that is you, you need uh, constructive criticism to improve wh whatever it is you're, you're writing or producing. And you need visible signs of accomplishment for later on. Let's just acknowledge that straight up and build that into the, into the process. Okay, so begin with the end in mind. Next, you've got to know the scope of what you're doing. Now, when you're in school, the scope is, is pretty much laid out by uh, the teacher or the professor, and it's also in, implicit in the amount of time that you have available, maybe through the number of credit hours you're taking or how many weeks are in a semester. But again, that sort of scaffolding won't always be there, and so you often have to decide upon your own scope for things. So think about your personal parameters and also in terms of project parameters. And when you're thinking about the scope, You've got to budget your time. You, you also have to take into account what you're personally capable of doing. So, uh, especially in the digital age where we have so much information available to us, we have to stop at some point. For example, it's, it's easy to get stuck in the exploration phase and not move on to the development phase. So, we, we have to be conscious of this and budget our time so that we are not accidentally allotting too much time to an earlier phase when we need to move on to a later one like, like formalizing things. We also have to be realistic about our own abilities. I often am pushing my students to learn new tools, and new, new digital capacities, digital literacy, and I think that's good for them, but I also recognize that you, you need to know yourself and how much you're up for. And so it, it may be that uh, as you are working on something and maybe trying to document your research, you learn a, a new tool like a, a bibliographic tool like Zotero and and that's part of your a kind of secondary goal as you're completing the main project is learning how you can use that tool but you can only budget so much time for learning new tools as well 
if you keeping your eye on the prize on what your, your main project or product is that you're trying to accomplish. So keep in mind, ask yourself, what are my personal parameters? If you're a student in school, it may boil down to how much time can I spend on this and when can I budget time for it? The project itself should have parameters, whether they're imposed on the outside or, they, or you establish them. What are the expectations and limits? This might be a quality or a quantity expectation. Uh, you know, it's good to ask questions and figure this out if it's not been explicitly made known. Um, it, are you trying to develop a process or are you trying to develop a product? Uh, what, what are the goals? Uh, one, one way to think about this is in business terms and, and ask what the deliverables are. And that's another way of talking about the formalization. You know, when are you actually delivering content or product or project uh, so that others recognize it as being uh, somehow complete at whatever stage? All right. Now I'm starting to talk about some of the, the principles that um, will, will make the digital algorithm different than if you were working prior to the digital age. The fact of the matter is, is that we have certain tools available to us that they don't simply make it easier for us to do what we were doing before. They actually make it possible for us to do different things and actually to improve the way that we develop things. And that's the spirit in which I want to communicate this. All right, iteration. What is iteration? It's repeating things. It's, it's doing things in cycles. It's starting something and then testing it and then going back and revising it. So there, there is a, a saying, and this comes out of software development, uh, and that is to, to publish early and often. And the idea from software was that um, uh, the earlier you, you were able to expose your, your code to other programmers, the, the earlier they would find bugs and help you to iron those out at an early stage. Or in a business setting, the earlier that you present things to a client, uh, the more quickly the client can clarify their, their expectations or those parameters, which may not always be all that set and clear to begin with. So iterating is a very practical thing to do because it helps you test things and it helps you get feedback so that you can improve what you're doing and better align with the, the goals of the project. Part of this means having faith that what you're producing in the early stages is okay to share. And that is a very difficult threshold for many people to cross because a lot of times you're, you're producing things that they're, they're just not complete and so you're embarrassed about sharing them. And, and that's where we need to allow for knowledge to be tentative and provisional and recognize that a lot of people are doing this. They're creating things publicly. If you're uh, online, some of the social media, you'll see a hashtag this WIP, which means work in progress. And that's actually sometimes very interesting from, from the outside to see what other people are up to. And because of that, you need to have faith that other people will find what you're doing interesting, even though it's, it's very clear that you might be in a beginning or, <clears throat> or in a middle stage with what you're doing. So this is a principle that I really want to drive home. Brief, shared, and tentative content is just as vital as finished formal content. Oftentimes, without the former, you won't get the latter. Uh, the old model tends to uh, prioritize a lot of private and finished production prior to any kind of dissemination or publication. And this is different than that. This is not a, a print-based mode. With our digital tools where it's inexpensive and simple to be able to share things quickly and broadly, we should do that and take advantage of that to enable us to get feedback and encouragement. This is what I call uh, social proof. Social proof is uh, w when you uh, can tell whether something is good or not by whether your your peers are doing that. Uh, it, it can it's a kind of a primitive idea in some respects, but it's also very sophisticated. We need to get our ideas out so that um, people not only can give us constructive criticism, but so that they can tell us that we're on the right path. And and we should have some faith that by sharing things with other people, they they will not scorn what we're doing or make fun of us, uh, but that in general people want to help other people to achieve their goals. So if someone else is doing something and it's clear what they're trying to do and they're sharing what they're doing along the way, think of it from that point of view, you are likely already to have encouraged people to continue with things that they are in the middle of trying to do. So have faith that people will reciprocate and do the same thing for you. 
And then along the way, you can get different levels of social proof. And I have a separate lecture about social proof, but essentially there are different types of audiences that you can uh, circulate what you're doing to. And in the process of, of, as you become more formal with the projects you're creating, you can change the types of audiences that you uh, request for feedback from. Now, as, as you go along the way, one of the benefits of this iterating and testing and, and early publishing and sharing is that it builds interest. And I'm not talking about interest in from the point of view solely of the audience, although that's certainly there. Um, I'm talking about it's going to help you build interest in this. Now, I've seen this over and over again as I've taught students to seek out social proof. Students are often kind of eh, so so motivated about their topics, you know, they just have to pick a topic and so they're not really into it, they're just doing it because it's an assignment. I get that. But when they started, when I've seen this, when they've started to share what they're doing, what they're researching with other people, and other people respond to it and say, yeah, that is really important, all of a sudden the student himself will take that more seriously as a topic. And that's good. You need that. You need to realize that other people are invested in the topic that you're developing. And, and so that will uh, get you motivated. And then over the course of time, if you continue to share things with people, you're actually building an audience so that by the time that you formalize whatever it is that you're producing, then you present it to people. There are some that are, oh good, we've been waiting for that. We've seen that in stages. Now we get to see the finished thing. Part of this uh, also relates to what I call a tiered content model. And I, I've shown this uh, elsewhere, but it's kind of a, a pyramid where you start with um, short content that you circulate broadly and so broadly, briefly, and generally to, to general audiences. You get feedback from that as you're developing your ideas, and then you have something that's a little bit longer, uh, the draft of a paper or a blog post or a, a prototype that you've created of a project or a video um, explanation, a, a, tr uh, a kind of spoken trailer of that uh, screenplay you're writing or that research paper that you're you're putting together. So that that's um, something that's, that's um, a little bit more developed. And at, as you have gotten early feedback from that first tier, then on the second tier you can share that that middleware, that middle project with other people and get a different type of feedback as they have a better idea of where you're going with this. And then finally the, the final tier would be to have that formalized content that, that is published or produced somewhere. Alright, now I want to talk about the actual three phases of this uh, algorithm for research and production. In doing this, and hopefully this graphic illustrates that, these phases are very much interlinked. And because of the iterative process, you can even see them as being a, a cycle that you keep going through. So even though I'm talking about them in a linear way, they should be seen as being very much overlapping and, and coordinate with one another and things that you can repeat over and over again on different levels. All right, so when you are in the exploration phase, and this is when you're doing research for a, a topic or a project, um, it, I think it's useful to think about the benefits of both traditional sources and some of the new sources that are, that are now available to us. Each one has something that the other does not have. So if you're going to traditional sources, that's going to be like general reference works and encyclopedias and guidebooks, etc. I think that many students don't, don't take advantage of research guides which librarians prepare and that's that's very useful because they can kind of um, give you starting points within a given field and uh, help you start with things that are more general rather than going to uh, the very specific scholarship about those topics too early. Uh, but ultimately it, these are solid sources, traditional sources, scholarly books and articles and, and you do want to go to those. Um, but but it's good to not go to them too too early and, and so that's why you need to start a little bit more generally and this also is a, a point where you can involve the social which I'll get to later and the social can help you filter traditional sources as well as give you new sources uh, print books they they are solid both literally and, and metaphorically and um, th they are also a way of understanding knowledge that is different than looking at things online uh, my students are typically uh, of the age where they're they're uh, digital first and, and they're really kind of bothered if they actually have to physically go to a library. Why can't I just find it online? 
Um, yeah, that's a, I understand that, and I'm very pro-digital, and I'm glad to see more and more resources becoming available digitally. But I also know that different formats by which you experience things give you different ways of thinking about them. And that's true in the exploration phase as much as anything else. So, I highly encourage my students to physically go to the library and browse the shelves around books that are relevant to the topic that they're looking at and to browse the reference areas as well because some of those reference books will be things they'd never thought of before and suddenly it might be very relevant to them and they hadn't thought of that and they would not have come across the same sources if they'd simply done a Google search. So uh, realize and, and budget time for using the, that traditional sources are, are worth um, consulting. Yeah, actually going to the physical library shelves. All right, now I want to talk about some of the new sources that you can go to. And uh, obviously there's some general online sources, uh, you know, Wikipedia, uh, for example. But um, there are also general online sources that you can get that are the digital versions of those general uh, reference works that I talked about that are in libraries. Uh, sometimes if you're affiliated with the university, there might be uh, research databases that you can go to that are of a general nature and can give you overviews of, of periods and events and people and, and history and things like that before you drill down to lots of really specific research on, on a given topic. Um, something that uh, people don't often think about is that the resources that instructors put online can be really valuable for people that are trying to get oriented to a given topic. So it's, it's very worthwhile to look up open educational resources uh, or to look up online courses or to look up a course syllabi. And that often, because especially syllabi, they're often geared towards people that are new in an area. And so that's especially useful for people in an exploratory field, uh, exploratory phase. Uh, they can see what teachers have given to students to um, cut their teeth on a given topic before they go to something that's more sophisticated, maybe harder to understand. This is a great benefit and something that people that do traditional research don't often think about. Find the teaching resources and then you can often find um, uh, more introductory ways into your sources. The, th we should not be afraid of some of the amateur and unvetted sources out there. Now, uh, students are taught to look for quality sources online and especially things that are peer-reviewed. I'm not, I'm not talking against that. And I'm not saying that we should rely on amateur and sources and things that have not been peer-reviewed instead of things that are peer-reviewed. But what I am saying is that especially in, in the exploratory phase, that sometimes going to amateur content will give you a way of thinking about things in a way that you would not get from the very formal uh, content that you find that it, that's peer-reviewed. Peer-reviewed content tends, tends to be uh, mono-medium. It tends to be mostly print or simulating print. And it, 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 you, know, you don't find many peer-reviewed movies, for example. And yet, you can watch movies and, and get informed about things and get ideas for things and in a way different than simply uh, you get from reading text. So I'm not speaking against peer-reviewed sources. I'm just pointing out that they are limited in their, maybe their points of entry or ways of understanding or ways of conceptualizing whatever topic. So it's okay to go to amateur and unvetted sources. You know, you have to have a filter and recognize there's a lot of um, stupid stuff out there and, and filter for that, but also not to be afraid to be uh, inspired by and interested in things by way of things that are not formally published in scholarship. Social media. Most of my students use social media just for socializing and maybe for uh, following the news or celebrities or things like that. They don't recognize that the social media can actually be a very powerful way to research topics for both uh, academic and for professional purposes. I have a separate lecture about um, using social media and sp some very specific social media uh, for doing research, but essentially um, the, the model I'm, I'm urging is that as much as you should be looking up ideas and topics, you should be looking up people. And the social media are ways of finding people who will then be sources for you uh, for getting feedback um, <clears throat> or for steering you to other uh, resources that you didn't know about previously. And essentially uh, what I am claiming, and I, I developed this more fully elsewhere, is 
that social sources can actually be more powerful than traditional uh, print-based or text-based sources like Google. And, and that may be hard to understand or, or to swallow, but I stand by it. Um, once you find people who have become experts in areas, they've spent their, their time and their career filtering for quality. And so they can be a much more efficient way of getting you to um, you know, search results than, than the algorithms of Google, however powerful Google may be. And I've kind of answered, I've already addressed this a little bit already, and that is um, research your topic by way of different media. So what happens if you're exploring a topic and instead of going to scholarship, which is text-based, you go to images from a given historical period or setting or whatever the topic has to do with? That might get you nothing, but it might, as I was saying before about amateur and unvetted information, it might give you new ways of thinking about that. Presentations. It's, it's possible now for people to load their PowerPoint presentations and other presentations online. And, and these are often very good as far as being introductory or general and orienting you to a field of knowledge that you didn't have before. I suggest going to slideshare.net or prezi.com and browsing what's available publicly. And again, that's a, a way of uh, not, not just finding a general resource, but of finding people. Okay, and uh, along the same lines, uh, when you're finding people, it isn't just individual experts, but you want to find communities, people that gather around a specific kind of topic. And, and you can join those communities, or you can at least visit the, their blogs or their online forums or wherever they mingle, and um, at least interact with them and recognize uh, what they're talking about and uh, sometimes that helps you to achieve more currency with your topic when you find people that, that are already quite invested in that and are discussing it. I didn't put this on there, but another approach along those same lines is to look up conferences. Conferences and symposia that are being held, uh, expos, things like that, that where th those tend to be gatherings that are very current and uh, there's often records of those online, even if they're in the past. You might find a, a record of, of people that have presented at a recent conference, and you could even contact some of those people. All right. Uh, this has to do with lifelong learning in general, and it's not necessarily tied to a specific kind of new media. Uh, maybe it's more of a new concept, and that is the PLN, or the Personal Learning Network, or the Professional Learning Network. And uh, think of it this way. If you are using social media, you're developing a network over time. And I realize we develop those networks in a haphazard way. You know, people find old people from high school find you and 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 various weird reasons why people connect with you. That's fine. It's that's just part of the landscape nowadays. Uh, but over time you might have noticed that as you use social media, certain people interact with you more or they become kind of go to people to help you solve problems. Well, it's possible to be more conscious about that. Uh, it may be that you want to move beyond Facebook or, or uh, an arena where you're merely talking among close friends. And that's why I encourage my students to use Twitter or Google Plus or LinkedIn uh, because these are more outward oriented and, and the sorts of contacts that you develop there may be of a more professional basis. They don't have to be, of course, but um, that's a place where a lot of content is being put online. and where you can uh, develop new networks. This happened to me this week. I attended a, an online uh, uh, webinar. It was a Google Hangout on Air. And uh, the people there were, were talking about this uh, online community they had on Google+. And so I visited that community and, and joined it. And all of a sudden now I have uh, about 100 people that I didn't know before that are thinking about something that I'm thinking about. And now they can be go-to people for me and I'm actually making use of them um, as I'm asking my students to, um, to, to try out some of their ideas publicly. Uh, I've already asked members of this group, and they're willing to do that. So this is an immediate benefit of, uh, and it's not hard to do, of creating a, 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 a personal learning network or a professional learning network. So I encourage my students to think about that. While they're in the middle of creating their current paper or project, they should also be 
thinking that they, they can, this is an occasion to curate and improve the quality of their contacts online. And that ends up being a source for them in the future. I've seen this in my own life. Uh, I've very consciously tried to follow people that I think um, matter in the areas that I study and to interact with them. And so now I have these friends that I can consult online. And as I was saying before, the people can be more powerful than just general searches. And they, your personal learning network can really be a go-to place for finding stuff out. All right. And as part of this exploratory stage, I think it's really critical that you find relevance. And I've already kind of talked about this in what I've said previously, but it's important as you're exploring that you just say, oh, let me find my topic so that I can have my paper for my teacher. Okay, you can do that. I mean, I, I did that as a student. It's, that's realistic. But you're going to have a better experience if you can ask yourself, how does this matter now? So currency and relevance to the our, our current situation. And I don't care what your topic is, there's a way of linking it to things that are going on in the here and now. And um, how is it relevant to the present? How is it re relevant to other people? You know, who, who are the stakeholders, the people that are experts or enthusiasts or, or that simply care about this topic? And then finally, how does it matter to me? And that, that might be the hardest part, especially if you're assigned a topic or you're in a class you don't really care about. But, it's, but I think it's possible, generally, for students to find a way to make the topics that they're studying be relevant to their own lives. And the, the more they do that, the more motivated they will be to do the hard work of research and development. All right, so in the exploratory phase, uh, some of it is kind of random. You're kind of throwing your net out wildly, wildly. You're looking here, you're looking there. That's fine. But as you go along, at a certain point, you should start thoughtfully annotating. So taking notes on what you're doing. It might be that in reading ebooks you're highlighting things and then later you can look up all those highlights on your Kindle device or, um, or uh, online. Or it could be that you're old school and you are you know, write, writing in a, a paper book or it could be you're, you're using note cards. Um, you need to have some kind of a system for annotating. And, and I'm not just talking about documenting, that's important too, but I'm talking about a place where you can keep track of things that, that matter to you. So you can, you can go back and review things that you looked at briefly on a first pass, and then on a second pass, be a little bit more thoughtful about them and ask yourself, is this something I want to do more with? So get in the habit of annotating as you're going along. Now that doesn't have to be really, really thorough. In fact, it, if it is too thorough, it will slow down your exploring. But at the very least, you can um, uh, jot down a note or two, whether it's in the margins of a book or in a notebook uh, or in a Google Doc uh, or in a spreadsheet. And, and there are other tools as well, social bookmarks. There are ways that you can annotate thoughtfully so that this will, will be a um, something of a starting point, a little bit of structure as you are starting to, to brainstorm for your actual paper or project. So if you have unannotated thoughtfully, then it is possible for you to go back and review things and to take notes. And there's an art to that all its own, and I won't talk about that now. Uh, but let me just say that it's part of the process. You, as you're exploring, you, you, know, you kind of take things down as being personally relevant. But when you review, your reading and your notes, then you start looking for coherence. So instead of going outward and exploring this, this, that, that, then you start finding the strands that connect together and synthesizing and pulling together until you actually have a topic. So finding relevance uh, also means uh, uh, doing the narrowing part after you've done the opening wide. Uh, you know, it's kind of this, this uh, funnel process. All right, and so then you're in a position to brainstorm. I mean, really, you're brainstorming as you're thoughtfully annotating. You're brainstorming as you're reviewing your reading and notes. But there are also some formal methods you can do to, to brainstorm. You can do, um, uh, you know, little clusters of bubbles on a, on a sheet of paper. Uh, there are a lot of brainstorming tools that are now available digitally. Um, you can simply go old school and talk it through face-to-face -face with a, a teacher or a fellow student or whomever someone in your personal learning network. And as you're doing that, you want to try out a few different approaches, a few different potential directions you could go, and start trying out claims that you could make. 
Claims help you focus what you do. All right. Uh, if you can make a claim, then you're going to be able to filter out a lot of things as not being relevant and focus much better. So th that's why teachers have asked students to come up with thesis statements. Uh, I have a separate presentation about thesis statements, um, which I might uh, put in the notes. Uh, there are different types of claims that you can make. Uh, there's there are definition claims and there are policy claims and uh, evaluation claims and so on. Um, but try out different ones and start using those. And the the claims can also be a, a test of whether you have found relevance. Because if if you say something and it's as a claim and it's not engaging to you personally or to others, then you haven't found your hook yet. All right, enough on that. Now I want to go on to the development phase. Briefly, I want to talk about documenting your research. And this ties in with what I was saying earlier about annotating. But I just am calling to mind the fact that you, you need to actually keep track of the sources that you are consulting so you can find them later. Uh, oftentimes, there's that really good website or something and you forgot how you found it. Uh, but also so you can document them later and, and cite them if you are actually referring to them in, in your research. So some of your, your, your documenting of your research I call casual curation and that's where maybe you just keep a, a set of links to, to things that you found. Uh, I especially encourage you to consider using some social bookmarking like uh, Digo or, or Delicious uh, or a bibliographical tool like Zotero to use if you're doing a lot of online research and that will help you to document your research and be able to categorize it and find it later. So you're kind of curating as you are exploring. So, it, you know, your curating can be on a, on a very simplistic level, as I was saying. You don't have to, in fact, you probably shouldn't try to formally get citations for everything that you are exploring, because that will slow you down. But you also don't want to lose that, because at some point, some of that you will need to formally document. So, um, that's why I say you might want to just keep a set of links, and therefore, uh, you know, maybe you don't go back to all of those websites, but you go back to a few of them, and a couple of them you read a lot, and, and maybe one of them you, you do cite and quote, and at that point you can derive the information that you need. Although there are tools like Zotero that you can kind of collect the all the citation information on the fly as you go. Uh, research log, consider creating a spreadsheet where you you put down, okay, this is what I was after today, this is what I found, and these are the links to things that I found. It's kind of an updating of uh, using index cards for research. All right. Now, I've, I've mentioned the, the principle of iteration previously, but it's in this development phase now where you really have to start iterating publicly. And I said that you should try to develop some claims, and, and those are provisional claims. You don't even know if you believe them yet, but they're a way of organizing your thinking and you can try them out with yourself and with others by circulating them. So you, I call this a tweet this, uh, so a claim that you can, uh, that's short enough that you can share in social media and, and should get some engagement from people, partly because it's a claim, partly because it's short, and partly because it's social. So try out some of your earliest ideas by circulating them uh, through your, your, your PLN or through whatever social media that you're on and have some faith that there are people there that you didn't think would care what you're working on that would care about what you're working on and might give you some responses. I'm always surprised, my students are always surprised by people coming out of the woodworks and, and being interested in something that you never thought they were. And so give them a chance to respond to what you're doing. And you keep it short because you're working on a very general level right now. In fact, you, you may try out several different ideas as you are exploring them um, and then as you do get that feedback, it gives you an opportunity to refine your own main ideas, to maybe revise your claim, and perhaps also to adjust your scope, because this is often the case that we start with projects that are too big and then have to find something that's more manageable. Another one of the advantages of iterating publicly is that it gives you an opportunity to discover new sources. Some of those are social sources, um, people and communities, and some of those are, um, you know, books or or uh, digital media of some kind that uh, people can refer you to. That's something, it's part of the sharing economy online. I mean, think of how many times you have sent a link to somebody, um, uh, may maybe because you realize that they are interested in something. 
Well, if, if you are the person who is <clears throat> circulating that you're researching something, other people are likely to respond by referring you to sources you didn't know about before. And that's one of the great advantages. And, and so that's a different approach to research. You're not going to a database. You're not going to Google. Um, you're, you're making use of the people who are engaging your ideas and you're kind of crowdsourcing your research to people that, that voluntarily care about this and, and, and are willing to give you feedback. Hopefully you have enough people in your, in your networks that you do find people that are willing to respond and respond respectfully and, and meaningfully. Um, often that's not the case and you have to have a certain level of tolerance for that. Sometimes your, your buddies will roll their eyes or say something sarcastic to you, but um, have faith that some people will respond seriously if you, if you show that you're seriously trying to figure something out. And I, I've already mentioned this, but along the way as you're iterating, uh, you are building that uh, personal learning network or professional learning network and, and building relationships with people while you're also building content. So keep that in mind. There's always this kind of social undercurrent for everything, and that is something that will pay off for you later on, not just with the present project. Okay, I've already mentioned curation on a kind of informal level, but in the development phase, it may be that you, you do need to more formally curate things. Maybe instead of just a list of links, you need to create a bibliography or an annotated bibliography. I think it's very useful to do that because um, I state your source, state um, what that source was about in a single sentence, and why that source may be relevant to your current research in a second sentence. This is a, a really helpful thing to do. If you curate your resources in the, in the course of doing that, you'll throw some out, you'll, you'll develop some cohesion, it'll help you to ask new questions that you can ask your PLN. Um, so bibliography is one way to, to do that. I've, I've talked elsewhere about curation and this nowadays can be done through a variety of different online methods. And each one has its advantages. I've talked elsewhere in this presentation about how different media can help you think in different ways. And so it may not be a bad idea to curate different forms of media about the content or, or topic that you're exploring. Um, playlists are, are another way of pulling together video or audio. Um, pin boards, it's an interesting uh, visually oriented way of curating things. Wikis are more text-based. Each of these have the, has an advantage and ha they have disadvantages. But I encourage you to uh, go beyond what you're used to and try out some of these that you haven't done before and recognize how they can be really powerful. One of them that I should have put up there, uh, I didn't yet, uh, is, is social bookmarking. I mentioned that earlier. But that's a way that you can do kind of on the fly curating, but then later if you've tagged things in your social bookmarks then you go and look up those tags later and all of a sudden you have this very organized set of resources. Um, that's, that's something that can be really helpful. Uh, ask yourself this question though, and this is because, I'm saying this because you can go down the rabbit hole of curating. I know, I mean, there are people that go on Pinterest and spend all day on that and that's all they ever do. I'm not against Pinterest. What I am against is getting stuck at one phase when something can end up being a kind of an entertaining, superficial end in itself, but it's not actually moving you to the next. It's not you're not in a process of development. You're almost in a holding pattern at a certain point. So that's you know you have to be conscious as a learner and recognize when am I wasting my time? And sometimes curating is a waste of time, as much as I believe in it. So. Ask yourself, is this really helping me to brainstorm? Is it helping me to organize and get more, co more coherent about my topic? And, and it also, is it helping me to document things? Because I do want to be able to keep track of them for later use. And uh, I just wanted to remark that uh, just as earlier I was saying in your exploratory phase, as you're working with people and getting those people uh, part of your, your PLN, and so there's a kind of secondary benefit of developing your social relationships relationships as you are researching. In, in a similar way, your curated content may not only be process, it may be product. The, the act of documenting your process can help you to build your identity online. And, and I think this is obvious to people who, who are on uh, Tumblr or on uh, Pinterest, where over time, uh, the pictures that people have accumulated or the various uh, links and, and websites that they have uh, curated, they say something about the person. 
and that might be a very helpful thing to give you some some clout and some credibility and, and maybe some street cred among people and that can help you in other ways like if you're trying to develop your personal learning network and if you can refer people to uh, something that you have curated they get a better idea of who you are it can help to you know flesh out your online identity so uh, keep in mind that as a, a very useful secondary purpose while you're doing research is to um, build your identity by publishing the things that you curate. Okay, so that's the development phase, and yeah, obviously it overlaps with the uh, exploratory phase. And finally, there's a production phase. Now, in this lecture, I'm not going to spend as much time on this as, as I, I might at another time. But I just want to touch on that. Because earlier I've said that in order to really um, achieve something with your, your learning and these also these secondary goals that I've talked about, there has to be some level of formalization. So I've, I've said, first of all, well, earlier I've talked about formats as part of parameters and you know knowing maybe what the expectations are if you have an assignment or a, you know your boss is giving you a task or something like that. And you need to know the formats so that you're prepared for those. So if, if the format is an oral presentation, you're going to prepare for that differently than if it's a, a, a written research paper. And you're going to prepare for a blog post differently than for a, uh, a research paper. If you know the format, it will change the way that you are um, um, polishing things up and develop, developing them to be shared. And that's really what the formalization is. The formalization is where you get things to a point that they're in a recognized format that is capable that's like a commodity that people understand a book uh, a PowerPoint presentation a white paper these are genres that are people already understand and so when you produce content within a, an understood genre then people can consider it like other things a YouTube video a how-to video right there's some general genres and more specific genres um, early on you should have a sense of what formats you're aiming for and then you know when you're done when you've formalized it. So when when you have um, uploaded that YouTube video or when you have published that ebook or whatever a formal process that happens with that particular format. Now as you're doing that, uh, you you can consider various occasions and various venues. So uh, occasions would be events where you could share things. Is there an online webinar? Is there a, a local conference? Um, it, are, is there a, a certain thing coming up that could coincide with when you publish your paper or your book? And that's part of thinking of the relevance of the here and now. How can I make the thing that I formalize and, and, and get out there be relevant? Well, I tie it in with current things going on within a given community or in society more broadly. And then venues. Venues are places. That could be physical locations or it could be places where, people, where things are published. It could be a, 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 a blog and you, and, and you um, submit a guest blog post. Or it could be an, an online publication or a print publication. Um, or it could be something like a conference. Again, a venue is a place where you can formally present, showcase, demonstrate, publish. Okay. And then the last part of this is the follow-up. Oftentimes students only think in, in terms of wrapping up the project and getting it out. And I understand that and sometimes that's good enough. But especially since we're thinking more in terms of an iterative process and that one thing we do will lead to other things we do later on, it is important to think in terms of the follow-up. So you need to have some sort of outcomes by which you measure things. Uh, is it number of downloads? Is it number of... Uh, um, you know, conversion, conversions to sales, if you're in that field. Um, it, is it that you get um, oral feedback from an authority that you respect? Uh, it, is it you've sold a certain number of copies? Uh, you, you have to find some kind of measurement to decide whether you're succeeding. Uh, is it that your, um, your clout score goes up, K-L-O-U-T, or, or maybe your, your Google page rank? Uh, there are different ways that you can measure things, whether it's informally or more formally for businesses, business purposes or for just amateur purposes, um, whether it's in person or digital. There are different outcome measurements and decide what those are so you know whether or not you've, you've succeeded. Um, 
Part of the follow-up is showcasing what you do. Now, you obviously can, can publish something at a given venue, like a, a paper can be published at an online magazine. All right, great. And that is a showcase for your work. But, um, and this is, again, part of building your own personal brand or your personal identity, where else can you showcase this? Can you put it on your resume, your digital online resume? You know, link it to your LinkedIn profile. Link it to your Google Plus profile. Um, put it onto a, a set of um, photos or documents on your Facebook account. Um, you should figure out ways that you can showcase what you're doing. And it isn't just a oh, bra brag about what you're doing or whatever. It's just part of establishing identity online. And it's useful for other people to be able to find what you have done. And they're not always going to find what you've done by way of a specific venue or publication arena. And they're more likely to find what you've done if you've linked it to one of your social profiles. Uh, Follow-up includes community clout. Uh, use what you're doing as a way to give yourself credibility. Uh, here's a quick example. One of my sons, he, he makes drums and he's part of an online community of makers of drums. Well, after he completed making a drum set, he could take pictures of that, document what he did, and share that online. And suddenly his voice gets to be a, a little bit more authoritative within that forum because he's someone who's actually gone the distance and, and he can showcase what he's done. So think about the way that you're not just um, showing off or putting something on an online resume, but use what you're doing as a way, as a point of entry to communities that you would not have access to before. If you can point to something, look, I've done this thing, all of a sudden they may be will more willing to talk to you than, than if you hadn't. And uh, ultimately that, that leads to leveraging opportunities. And, and it's, it's a reason for you to create content and put it online and to associate with, with your personal profiles so that um, you can um, build trust and, uh, other, and respect from other people in various communities and, and that can lead to invitations and other opportunities. All right, so that's the production phase. That's the overall algorithm. And once again, I just wanna emphasize that this differs from your standard approach because it, it's more personally driven, it's more social, it's more iterative, it's more multimedia, and it has a vision of you doing something that matters not just now, but in the future, both for other people who might benefit from how you formalize something, and also for yourself in building your own identity online. Okay, there you go.